Lord, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. This is the day that you have made, and in it we rejoice and we are glad. Because, Lord, it's a day to celebrate the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross and to celebrate the power of his resurrection. So we know, Heavenly Father, that in this place, all things are possible right now. Everyone here came with a testimony because you answer our prayers. And now, Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you because new testimonies are being created in this place right now. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit for healing, physical healing in our bodies, healing in our emotions. Yes, Lord, healing in all areas of our lives, restoration in our careers, restoration in our relationships. Yes, Heavenly Father, restoration in our businesses, in our finances. We thank you, Heavenly Father. Do all that is in your heart to do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. (laughs) It's a blessed day. (laughs) It's a blessed day for me, and it's a blessed day for you. All right? Let's continue our discussions on taking action. Matthew chapter 25, what God is doing for us this season is amazing. He's helping us to bridge the gap between what we know and what we do. And for some people, that's a huge gap there. Huge gap. And... I see amazing miracles, powerful breakthroughs that have been waiting for us and will be connecting with them this season through action. All right, we'll read from Matthew chapter 25. We all know the story, all right? (laughs) We all know the story. It's the parable of talents, as it is called. We won't read the whole story, but we will read from the man who got one talent. Let's read from verse 24. Matthew 25 from verse 24, we'll read verses 24 to uh, 26. Are you there? Matthew 25. 24 to 26. Let's go. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. 26. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Let's have 27. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming I would have received back my own weight interest. (laughs) My focus is on verse 25. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. I'm giving it back to you exactly the way you gave it to me. So let's title our discussion Taking Action in Spite of Fear. Taking Action in Spite of Fear. We know the story. Um, This man, wealthy man, gave out some amounts of money, varying degrees, to each of his servants. He gave five talents to one. He gave two talents to one. He gave one talent to one. And the Bible says that he gave to each one according to his ability, according to their capacity. 
The interesting thing I observe about this parable is the fact that the boss had an accurate assessment of the capabilities of his servants. So in deploying resources, he deployed the resources according to their capacity to manage the resources. So you would see at the end of the day that his judgment was accurate in giving this young man only one talent. (laughs) See, he limited his risks. And sincerely speaking, these, Jesus was just communicating spiritual truths when he shared this. Heaven will give you resources to the degree to which you can manage them. (laughs) Some people think that the deployment of resources from heaven answers to prayer. They do not realize that it answers to maturity. It answers to capability. That's it. God knows that if he answers the prayers of some of us to deploy the resources we're asking for or to give us the opportunities that we are praying or asking for, we will waste those opportunities. So there's a reason why this guy didn't get five talents. I don't know how much he prayed. I don't know how much he fasted. But the thing that heaven looked at in deploying resources in his direction was his capacity to manage the resources. Anyway... The core of our attention here is on the need for us to take action. There is this huge gap between what we know and what we do. God wants us to bridge the gap. So James chapter 1 verse 22 says, Do, he said, and be doers of the word and not hearers only, doing what? Deceiving yourselves. You and I are delivered from deception. In the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? So, one of the major reasons people don't act on what they know is fear. Did this guy know that he was supposed to do business with the resources he was given? Yes, he did. Had he watched his boss? do investments before? Yes, he had. Did he do anything with the resources given to him? No, he didn't. Did he exploit the opportunities at his disposal? No, he didn't. Is each of us here functioning to the degree of our maximum potential right now? No, we aren't. Has each of us, you know, applied the the principles that we have learned? Have we acted on all the notes we've written in the last six months or one year? No, we haven't. We need to bridge the gap between what we know and what we do because that's where the blessing is. So I have discovered that one of the major reasons why people don't take action is fear, and we need to deal with it. That's what we have with this young man. He said, I was afraid. (laughs) I was afraid afraid. It's either the fear of failure, which we have mentioned before, number one reason for failure, the fear that they would fail, the fear that things will not work out. Or it's the fear of criticism. What will people say? Or even the fear of death. You know, there are different categories of fear. But one major reason why people will not act on revelation, however powerful it is, one major reason why some people will not act, even if if it's an angel that appeared to them, (laughs) is they are afraid. I will reiterate again from James 1.22. If you do not act on what you know is right to do, you are deceiving yourself. It is practical self-deception to not act on what we know. And in John chapter 13, verse 17, Jesus said, if you know these things, he said, blessed are you if you do them. John 13, 17. In In the King James Version, it says, if ye know these things, 
happy are ye if you do them. In the Amplified Bible, the blessed there has in brackets happy, fortunate, prosperous, and to be envied. If you do these things, <laughs> blessed and happy and to be envied are you. If you do what? Practice them. You will be happy. Your happiness is rooted in your action orientation. You're being blessed. You're being fortunate. Now listen to me. <laughs> the word that they use outside of church is the word lucky. You will be lucky if you act on the things that you know. And he says, to be envied are you. You just don't know how much of an inspiration you provide to other people when you are someone that steps out courageously to attempt to achieve your dreams. So, the thing that stops most people from enjoying that dimension of life is fear. Fear always holds the promise that you will be punished for taking risks. That's why people don't take risks. Fear gives people the promise that they will be punished if they try. That's the unfortunate thing. When you allow fear to speak to you, it will paint pictures in your imagination and all those pictures will position you as someone that will be punished for taking risks, for making mistakes, for trying. But once you attach those pictures of punishment, those pictures of destruction, of failure, even death, to the attempt to achieve, you will never attempt anything. It will paralyze your initiative, paralyze you. <laughs> you will see huge imaginary mountains that are ready to fall on you if you make a move. So fear holds the promise that someone will be punished for taking risks. When you understand this, you will recognize the language of fear. When fear speaks to you, you will recognize. This is fear coming. And you will know how to deal with it. Okay? Now, when I read again that passage that we read, I see a connection between leadership and fear. There is a culture of leadership that creates this kind of a structure. In fact, many people who lead in families, in organizations, leverage what we call the fear management technique. People believe that some people will not act to the best of their ability except you put them under pressure. And that pressure is created by fear. You make them to be afraid they're going to lose their jobs, for example. Hear what this guy said. I was afraid. He said, I, I knew you to be a hard man. That was what he said. So there was something about his perception of his boss that fueled his fear. The good news here was he was not the only servant. He was not the only servant. So how come the other two guys were able to take practical steps to multiply their own talents or the resources at their disposal? So there is a culture of leadership that fuels this kind of fear. And the culture that Jesus grew up in and functioned in was like that, the leadership culture. You remember that in Mark chapter 10, when his disciples were arguing about who was going to be ahead of who, that Jesus spoke to them. If you read, especially from verse 42, Mark chapter 10, verse 42, he said, you know that among the Gentiles, their rulers do, do what? Lord it over them. He said, but among you, it shall not be so. What I see here is when you have maybe been part of a family or been part of an organization that is driven by fear, you've been, you've been part of a, a system 
or a group or a team where you are cautioned excessively for taking risks, for attempting to achieve much. If you belong to a circle of friends where they caution you too much or create imaginary problems for you when you want to strike out on your own and you want to do something nobody has tried before, if you stay too long in such a culture, if you evolve from such a culture, the likelihood is that you will carry it over with you to the extent that even when you now find yourself in an environment where you are encouraged to take action, to try, the likelihood is that you will project your past experiences on your new boss. That's what happened to this guy. Listen, let me, let me, let me describe that culture a little bit because I think I have an idea what it looks like. Because I think I grew up in such a culture. We have this proverb. And you know, the proverbs sustain and reinforce the culture. There's this proverb in, in, in the part of the world that I come from. If you break the coconut on somebody's head, the person will not leave to eat out of the coconut. That sounds deep, doesn't it? Sounds very wise, doesn't it? Sounds like... Wisdom that is out of this world, isn't it? It's a fear-based proverb. It's a fear-based proverb. The challenge here is if you are afraid to put down your head for them to crack the coconut on it, the problem is you will never eat from that coconut and nobody else will eat out of that coconut. You and your generation will die and go away. The coconut will not be cracked. Your children will not eat out of it. And if you transfer <laughs> the spirit of fear to them, you transfer the Proverbs, they will not eat out of it. Their own children will not eat out of it. Fear-based culture. I was afraid, he said. I was afraid, and I went, and I knew that you were a hard man. But excuse me, the same man you are accusing as being a hard man gave five talents to someone. How come your contemporary was able to turn five talents into ten? Your excuse is dead. I love this Chinese proverb. The man who says that something cannot be done should not disturb the man that is doing it. <laughs> you know why I love the proverb? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you can see it. The man who says something cannot be done should not disturb the person who is doing it. In other words, right there, while you are describing how and why it cannot be done, someone somewhere is doing it. While you are arguing with the prophetic word, someone somewhere is believing it, catching it, acting on it, and getting results with it. In the name of Jesus Christ, by the authority and the power of Christ, the power that raised Christ from the dead, I bind every spirit of fear and I cast them out now in the name of Jesus Christ. So, fear holds the promise that you will be punished for taking risks, that you will be punished, you know, for making that phone call, that you will be punished for submitting that application, that you will be punished, punished for saying the truth. So fear, now, now let me say this. You need to be conscious when you come across this fear-based leadership and management technique and make sure that nobody puts you in bondage because it will stop you from fulfilling your destiny and forever you will be giving other people as an excuse for not doing what you were supposed to do. And you need to follow the examples of those who have gone ahead of us. If anybody was supposed to be afraid, it was the disciples of Christ. And the people that had the power of government wanted to beat them. At the risk of being beaten, they were told to not speak in the name of Jesus Christ anymore. You remember what they said? Whether it is right in the sight of God or in your own sight for us to say the truth, 
you judge. But we will not stop to speak about the things that we have seen and heard. That's courage. And the Bible says there in Acts chapter 4 verse 13, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. In the bid to not offend man, you will offend God. You have to make up your mind who you will please and whom you are going to get your sense of approval from. Fear puts people in survival mode and makes them less strategic. Fear puts people in survival mode and makes them less strategic in their thinking and in their actions. This guy was not thinking about the future. He could not see the future. When people are afraid, they fight for survival. Fighting for survival is fighting to stay alive today until tomorrow. When you're fighting for survival, you don't think five years, you don't think 10 years. This guy could not see ahead. Fear-based cultures all over the world are never strategic. They never see ahead. But eventually, you see what happened? The people who overcame their fear and took action. When the master came back, came back somewhere in the future, they got double what they had before. The guy that had only one, I'm sure you remember where the story ended. The master said, take the one talent from him and give it to the person who is willing to take risks. He said, for to him that has, more will be given. But from him that does not have, even what he has will what be taken away from him. Amazing. Amazing. He said, then throw the unprofitable servant into darkness. Okay? He said, well, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I call that regret. At the end of the day, the person who's overcome by fear, who will not act on what he or she knows, who will not act on his or her dreams, ends up with regrets. The person who is willing to take risks is more strategic. Fear breeds selfishness. Fear breeds selfishness because once it puts you on that channel of survival, all you'll be thinking about is how you will survive. It robs you of the capacity for sacrifice, which is what you need for the success of the collective. If you have a family, if you have a group, if you have a nation, the only way potential can be unleashed is when people are willing to sacrifice. And you won't sacrifice except you are willing to take risks. You will not take risks as long as your heart is filled with fear. My encouragement today is, as a Christian, that you understand fear is more, just, more than just a fleeting feeling. Fear is destructive. Fear will rob us of the fulfillment of our destinies. To break free from fear, give yourself permission to make mistakes as part of your learning experience. I beg of you today to give yourself permission to make mistakes in the process of acting on what God has told you. Faith is a business of risk. It will always be a business of risk. And I'll tell you how dangerous this thing is. Fear will stop a lot of people who are successful today from succeeding further. They took risks before they've lost the capacity to take risks, simply because they have achieved some success based on the risk that they took before. And that's why God will always look sometimes and just pick, some, pick someone. Pick a David. Pick a David. Pick an unknown person. There's someone listening to me today. <laughs> There's someone listening to me today that God is bringing out of obscurity. Someone that has nothing to lose. Someone who's willing to stake everything on what God has said. Someone who's willing to act on his dreams, act on her dreams. And sincerely speaking, God is waiting for you. When David ran towards Goliath, wasn't that a risk? The risk was he could lose his life. 
2 Kings chapter 7, there's a story of the four lepers at the gate of Samaria. There was a prophetic word already. By this time tomorrow, things are going to turn around. There was a prophetic word hanging. Only God knows how many people have prophetic words hanging on their heads. But those words are not materializing in the physical. There was a prophetic word. By this time tomorrow, the economy would have turned around. And nobody was acting. The king wasn't acting. The elite weren't acting. The successful people around weren't acting. It was four lepers. Four lepers at the gate of Samaria. They had a discussion among themselves. Why should we stay here till we die? And that's the question I'm asking you today. Why out of fear should you stay where you are and die and fizzle out? The economy is changing. We're behaving like the frog in the kettle. You put the frog in cold water. You know, you, you throw the frog into hot water, it flies out. You put the frog in cold water in a kettle. You put it on the fire. It stays there feeling cool in the cold water. Well, you, you, you fire up. You know, the stove, the kettle boils, okay, gradually the frog stays there till the water is boiling, till the frog is cooked and then it dies. We can respond to sudden change, we cannot respond to gradual change. The environment around us is changing. It's time for us to jump ahead in fulfillment of God's promises to our lives. Someone say amen to that. All right, you want to break free from fear? Give yourself permission to make mistakes as part of your learning experience. And most of the time, if you are acting on what God said, you will realize it was not a mistake. You will record miracles practically every single time. Number two, celebrate yourself for trying new things. I mean, it's not all the time that you may get the results that you want, but for trying, celebrate yourself. Next, Get as much information as you can about your subject. The more you know what is going on, the more you know how it works, the less your fear. Get as much information as you can. Next, get a revelation because the revelation gives back to faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. What God says to you is different from what you read in the book. When he has spoken it, he will also bring it to pass. And then I will add this, be filled with the Spirit of God. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Some people want to overcome shyness or timidity. They take drugs. Some take alcohol. What do you have to take as a Christian? Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. When the Holy Spirit is with you, you are conscious Conscious of the presence of God. Let me read Isaiah 41 verses 8 to 10 as I close. But you, Israel, are my servant. Isaiah 41, 8 to 10. But you, Israel, are my servant. Jacob, whom I have chosen. The descendants of Abraham, my friend. You whom I have taken from the ends of the earth. And called from its farthest regions. And said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Someone say a good amen to that. Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 2 Timothy 1, 6. And the special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed, keep that ablaze. <laughs> That's Message Bible of 2 Timothy 1 verse 6. The special gift of ministry you received when I laid hands on you and prayed, keep that ablaze. Don't let what God has started in your life fizzle out. It says in verse 7, God doesn't want us to be shy with his gifts, but bold and loving and sensible. Hallelujah. <laughs> God doesn't want us to be shy with his gifts. Don't be shy with the prophetic word. Don't be shy with the anointing of God on your life. I prophesy in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, that you be filled with the Holy Spirit. I drive out every spirit of fear, every spirit of anxiety, every spirit of worry in the name of Jesus Christ. As you step out of here, the power of God invades your heart, fills you spirit, soul, and body. As you step out there, I declare that you step out fearless. Kind begets kind. 
you cannot be the offspring of the lion of the tribe of Judah and be sheepish in the name of Jesus. As you go out today, I declare, the doors of favor open for you. Whatever you say by the inspiration of the Spirit of God and with courage and boldness, heaven and the earth will move at the sound of your voice in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the person present in this service who says, Pastor, please pray with me that God should forgive me my sins. My relationship with God is not okay. Can I say a short prayer with you? Just put your hand on your heart where you are and we'll pray together right now. Pastor, pray with me that God should forgive me my sins. Perhaps you've said this prayer before you want to rededicate your life to Jesus. Can you also put your hand on your heart, please? And if you're watching on the internet, please put your, put your hand on your heart and let's pray together. If you're right here in this auditorium, you want to be a part of this prayer. Can you please stand by your chair where you are? We'll be done in about one minute. Can you please stand? God bless you for your decision right now. See, it takes courage. It starts from here. Act on what you just heard. If you're standing, please say this prayer after me. Dear God, I believe that Jesus paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me and to accept me as your child. Thank you for hearing my prayer. In Jesus' name. Amen.